Staffing Priorities for Workforce Transformation Remarks by John Cawthorn, Vivian Lewis, Shimo Wang, and Tito Sierra at the 2012 ARL Fall Forum, convened by Ann Kenny. So, welcome back. I'm Ann Kenny, uh, the Carly Crock uh, University Librarian at Cornell. And it's my pleasure to introduce two sessions that are coming up. Each of these sessions will be about a half hour. Uh, I know they've timed their presentations to allow for questions and comments as well. Creating a vital workforce for the 21st century, Research Library challenges us to think about the future in different ways and to create new pathways. How we define this future and develop strategies for building a workforce that is prepared to support the needs of 21st century students and researchers is vital. We'll be hearing two research projects that will highlight data about future service trends and staffing priorities. The first session is 21st Century Research Library's Workforce Transformation Case Studies, which will feature three people, many of whom you've already met, uh, John uh, Cawthorn, Vivian Lewis, and uh, Shamo Wang, uh, engaged us last year uh, in using the ARL 2030 scenarios as part of their Research Library Leaders Fellow Program. Their presentation will summarize their findings from discussions and focus groups about the workforce transformation through the lens of the 2030 scenarios. Their bios are in the uh, program materials, so I'll forego those, and, but I do want to point out that each one of them came up to me independently and said, you do not have to spend much time introducing us. <laughs> I said, I have done one or two of these. <laughs> so, you know, these research libraries leaders fellows are not only really wonderful, they're a little feisty. So, John Cawthorn, Associate University Librarian, Organiza Organizational Development and Assessment at Boston College, Vivian Lewis, Interim University Librarian McMaster, and Shamo Wang, Dean and University Librarian at the University of Cincinnati. Good afternoon. Thank you, Anne. We just didn't want it to go too long, so um, I want to thank you for the introductions and very short. So our presentation is organized uh, in three parts. I'm going to first talk a little bit about uh, the background and overview for our project. Second, Vivian is going to share some key findings from our conversations and research held over the 18-month RLLF program. And third, our colleague and new dean, university librarian Shimu, is going to discuss new skills and competencies uh, for our future workforce in research libraries. Now, we're only going to take about 20 minutes, and that'll leave some time for questions and reactions. But before I get started any further, I want to thank several people for us being up here. There are a lot of people behind us, of course, and uh, the ARL staff, Sue and Judy, have been really wonderful, and Carton Rogers has been great and encouraging as the chair of the Transforming Research Libraries Steering Committee. He could have said, no, this is a terrible idea, but uh, he didn't, and we appreciate that. Dieta and um, Duane have been wonderful in their stewardship of all of our projects. Uh, and Charles Lowry, we want to give him a very special thank you because he facilitated some conversations with senior fellows in August. Um, and we're also very grateful to many of our RLLF colleagues who helped us facilitate some of these conversations in May with the ARL library directors. And I'm, I must not go any further without saying how much of a pleasure it is to work with Vivian and Shimu. They are very smart, and it's just my pleasure, really. So here, let's start with the first slide. All right. So for us, this project started when we met in Atlanta uh, during a training session for how to facilitate discussions using the ARL scenarios. And since I only have 20 minutes, I'm not really going to go into each one of these four scenarios in any great detail. I assume you read them. You might have read them a long time ago, but you read them. And, uh, but I can tell you this and set the stage. They're basically four fictional stories, and they're intentionally focused on what the research enterprise might look like in the year 2030. They're created by 30 leaders from ARL institutions, um, plus provocateurs and ARL staff. Each story uh, features fictional researcher Hannah Chen, 
And of course, what makes these scenarios so provocative and challenging, I think, is that uh, the library is not written in them. And if you've read them, you know that they really force us to kind of think of outside of our comfort zone. And so what Vivian and Shimu and I recognize right away is that their value lies not in predicting the future, but rather in helping us frame conversations everyone in our organization can recognize, understand, and begin to test different futures. And it's with this so much uncertainty in our environment, and I mean uncertainty by um, the, related to funding and scholarly communication and placing our services that we also appreciate, and we did it almost simultaneously when we read them, that if used correctly, uh, these powerful stories will help leaders articulate how decisions we make today uh, might play out in the future. So because the library was not written into the scenarios, uh, we felt there was a great opportunity to first imagine what the research library might look like. We use these scenarios as planning discussion tools with current and future uh, research leaders as the basis for the research. We also thought when leaders talk about workforce transformation, particularly with our current organizations, they must ground these conversations enough to help staff and librarians at all levels uh, understand the implications, possibilities, and I think real opportunities we have in future directions. Finally, we wanted to make recommendations for ARL libraries in how best to use these scenarios and place our findings in the research. And before I get off the stage, I'll have some questions that might help you help us think about where to place this. Um, so this is what we did. We facilitated some conversations. Uh, we had groups of people. We separated them up into four groups and gave them each a scenario. We started with the RLLF fellows in uh, University of British Columbia in October 2011. We cleaned that up a little bit uh, for ARL library directors in May uh, of 2012. And as I said before, Charles Lowry did a great job facilitating the senior fellows uh, uh, cohort uh, that met in August of 2012. And we asked the participants uh, four basic questions. Um, oh. So we asked a question, four basic questions. As a researcher, um, what are Hannah's information research needs? And since the library is not present in the scenarios, we asked participants to tell us what the library looks like, its functions, its opportunities. We also had participants imagine what skills and competencies will be needed in this future library. And finally, we asked participants to tell us what decisions we can make today, we can make today, that will help move us towards that future, whichever future they were given. Um, and so as I bring up Vivian, there are several questions I want you to think about, because um, we're committed to kind of placing this research where it needs to be. Uh, we're going to write for Arrow publication, certainly, but we'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, other outlets for this research. And you might also help us think about other uh, groups that we might add to the conversation, like HR professionals, faculty, provost. I'm not going to tell you who else, but you can come up with some, some names. So with all that background, I think you'll be able to follow uh, the real star of our presentation, uh, Vivian Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone. May I just ask, how many people in the room have actually read the ARL scenarios? I am so happy to hear that. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. Um, before I get started, I, I just wanted to say what a great honor it is to be part of this very important conversation within ARL libraries. And as well, it's been a tremendous amount of fun, and um, I'm, I'm really happy. Uh, when we met with the ARL directors back in, in um, the spring, uh, one of our great concerns was, how embarrassing will this be if no one actually comes to hear our preliminary results? And I'm so happy to say that the ARL directors came in great numbers, and, and it gave us a huge amount of information to play with. And so that's, that's been very reassuring. I'm going to go through these slides quite quickly. I can assure you that the information will all be loaded on the ARL website, so you don't need to, to write madly. Um, as John has mentioned, the stories of Hannah Ching in the year 2030 do not explicitly mention the libraries. 
And this actually was a, a source of, of, of great concern and in some ways discomfort with some of the participants in our conversations. And in some ways, it's actually hard to imagine what Hannah could possibly want from the research library 20 years or so down the road. It's really hard. And in some cases, some of the participants found the, the, the experience somewhat grim. And in um, observing it and, and reflecting on our, our discussions with various participants, we noted something somewhat unusual. We noted that when we discussed these, these scenarios with the ARL directors, they tended not to be as alarmed as some of our other participants. And it was almost as if they were so used in their, in their careers to looking over the brink that, that it wasn't quite as frightening. <laughs> I leave that with you uh, for consideration over a coffee or a long glass of wine tonight. And if anyone has any suggestions for why, I'd like to hear. The other thing we noticed was that all of our participants were, were very clear in how important they found this conversation. The discussions were lively and sometimes they were quite emotional and there was a clear sense that participants wanted others in their organization to walk down the hallways with Hannah as well and to experience some of the things that we were sharing with them. There was also a sense that some of our senior university administrators were really not thinking to the year 2030 and, and possibly they should be brought into this conversation as well. There was also a, a, a feeling that when you looked forward, no matter what you saw, you saw fewer people. And all of the groups sensed that the, the traditional face-to-face -face type a transactional work that's happening in ARL libraries today is probably going to happen in a, at a lesser degree as we look forward. In many cases, it was hard to picture Hannah ever entering a library. Um, or ever consulting a, a, a service desk in the way that we think of as, as most common today. And as well, the, the whole issue of the composition of the workforce was something that was of great interest, and, and we, we teased this out a little bit further in our findings. Most participants saw that the proportion of lower skilled um, staff within our libraries, the ones that are traditionally delivering face-to-face -face transactions like circulation, that there would be fewer of those kind of staff in the future. It's hard, for example, to see Hannah Chen signing out a book. That was, that was quite clear. And the other thing that we, we really noticed with all of our groups was the concept that collaboration was no longer an optional activity. And we really heard some uh, very powerful statements around collaboration. In at least three of the four stories, there are very few universities actually left. And those that remain are grappling with terrible funding issues. And in many of the scenarios, Hannah is partnering with colleagues in other parts of the world just to keep going as a researcher. One ARL director said it best. She noted that the concept of a single author, a single institution is gone, especially in STEM disciplines. It was collaborate or perish. One of the other themes we heard a lot about was data curation, and this really reflects a lot of the conversation that's gone on during the last couple of days at the ARL director's meeting. We heard time and time again how this really was our future. And we talked about the key roles of preserving and curating data, of advocating for open access. And we really heard this, this um, issue that the, there was going to be a real change in what we considered our primary focus. This sense that we were in the year 2030 no longer going to be focusing on the delivery of the book or the peer-reviewed article. That wasn't our future. Our future from the scenarios appeared to be in data curation and data management.
And we heard many, many reflections on what this all means to the future of the librarian. And I must admit, we heard a lot of emotions and a lot of opinions on this subject. We did hear a few voices suggesting that the future of the MLS was unsubstantiated and that we'd be better to hire deep subject experts and walk away from the librarian as the future of our organizations. But the far louder voices called for the continued importance of the librarian in our organizations, I'll bet with a significant retooling. We heard some very interesting discussion, which I'd love to walk out with you about the future of teaching and learning. This was something that I think in some of my conversations uh, have, have been uh, a point of, of real concern and, and interest uh, for colleagues. There was some sense with some of our participants that the current focus being placed on teaching, learning, and research as our, as our true focus today in 2012 isn't necessarily the focus going forward in the year 2030. And that as our universities um, actually walk away from some of the focus on education and they start handing off that to, to um, uh, commercial ventures, which is what you see in a lot of the scenarios, that the implication for libraries is that we walk away from teaching and learning as well. Something to consider, and I'd like to hear your comments on that. We heard a lot about skills and competencies in the future workforce. We heard a lot about agility, flexibility, that we need staff who can adapt to new realities and can accept change and transform themselves rather than waiting for us to transform them. Uh, we heard the importance of deep subject expertise and far less room for generalists. We heard the critical importance of IT skills, of data curation skills, of intellectual property and rights management. One that was of great interest to us was cultural and linguistic diversity, and this reflects very well on some of our comments in the last session. The global follower, follower scenario has Hannah Chen working as a tenured professor in a Chinese university located, some, but located somewhere within the United States. But all the scenarios display some aspects of global positioning and global collaboration as a strategy to retain pertinence. Again, I'd like to hear your, your comments on that one. We blended several characteristics into a broad category we call entrepreneurism. Informal conversations with librarian peers suggest that some of these competencies are considered a bit controversial. These aren't the characteristics that many of our librarians came into the profession with, and some of our colleagues may even find some of them unappealing. Um, we grouped the last few in terms of, of literacies. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, geospatial literacy and in terms of data visualization as important literacies as we see in going forward. And finally, the last category is, in, in, is around interpersonal skills, but at a very deep level um, that takes us towards the ability to form deep collaborations with our faculty. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Shimo who is going to talk to us a little bit about preparation. My part of the summary will be focused on that last question about what we can do now to prepare the future. Uh, you can hear from my presentation, many of since I'm aware many of the AR institutions already practice, uh, but it, we hope those are reflect uh, much more larger uh, trends uh, for what we're doing now uh, to prepare for the future. We heard that prepare the future, we should focus on three R's. They are recruiting, retraining, and retooling or restructure. The rec on the recruiting, we heard we should hire for the competencies rather than for credentials. The competencies we should focus on those new emerging skill sets, technology skill sets, data, deep data, deep subject domain skills, 
cultural you heard from the John and the Vivian language skill sets, etc. We also heard we should hire for potential, potential for the aptitude of learning and attitude to facing the future challenge rather than the years of experience. Let's face it, in some new areas like research, research data management, there's no much about the years of experience you can hire. So that potential is extremely important. We heard we want to create in our organization a career opportunities for, to hire the people with the new title and the new responsibilities, especially aiming on attract those non-library information science degree uh, graduates to our professions. We also heard we need to pay people more. Uh, the salary was on the table uh, over the previous uh, uh, presentation. The com compensation is really important to compensate people for the responsibilities. Uh, not exactly about their educational credential, but rather what is the market going to pay them. I always said, if this guy walk out across the street, working for another, even the non-profit, uh, organization, how much he is going to get paid. Uh, that's the, uh, what we heard. We heard the directors, uh, for those of you who are Dean University Library directors, uh, you should see yourself have the large role to play for yourself in the hands-on recruiting for new people. Uh, at um, Emory, uh, Rick Luce and I practice none of the professional position will get hired unless either of us have the time to interview this person. At my new institution, Cincinnati, I made the staff aware, no matter where I am, how busy I am, whether in China or the Europe, even if it's the Skype meeting, I have to see any single professional position get into the organization. Retraining and retooling. Uh, we heard we should streamline current workflow, eliminate routine works whenever it's possible and free up the uh, existing capacity and repurpose them. Let's face it, there's only two ways in today's economic situation you can create the capacity. Hiring new and repurpose existing. Uh, we heard we need to get our librarians uh, out to the library and they say and be seen by especially our research faculty team. We heard we offer the, we should offer rich re training and development opportunities as broadly as possible for our professional team, and we also should selectively cultivate our stars with the very limited investment on the such as the training, traveling, and all of those strategic investment. We, embed, we should embed our librarians in the research team that I mentioned before, and uh, uh, we should cultivate the data management digital scholarship skills now. Retooling and training, re, 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 retraining, um, we heard uh, the direct says we seek out we should seek out the real and uh, meaningful collaboration project with other institutions, not only just with libraries. Testing rationales, piloting the radical concept is good, but just do it. Don't sit over there with the six months of the research, another six months of the pro, pros and cons analyze. I think we just need to do it created the culture of the collaboration between the uh, MIRS uh, graduates uh, and the non-MIRS professionals coming to our institution uh, appears to be extremely important for the future of our organizational culture. Uh, directors and other senior managers be ready to disrupt your organization at least in a small ways to affect the change. In general, we should collectively, selectively forget the past, streamline the present, and work to the future. 
With that, my last slide, and uh, I'd like to, on the behalf of our three of our researchers, pose some of the questions. Hope to stimulate some of the conversation after. Uh, our near-term outcome for this project is today, this presentation plus, we're being invited to write the essays for the publication for the ARL Research Library issues. And for the long-term outcomes, we have a question mark. We'd like to hear your advice. Most important, we have the, some questions uh, to, to ask you. What alternative channels of communication should we pursue? Are, the, are there other people or groups we should bring into this conversation? You heard we engaged directors, my fellow groups, as well as the UCR fellows uh, uh, training. The last question is, what is the best way to use those fundings to affect current practice in the ARL libraries? I think that's the most important question to summarize my presentation. Thank you. I want to thank uh, our colleagues for their uh, provocative presentation. We have time for one or two questions now. We'll come back uh, at the end of Tito's presentation and open for more general discussion. But are there any specific burning questions right now that anyone wants to ask? Yes, Sarah. Your somewhat controversial finding that at least some directors see um, the trend being away from our profession anyway, uh, focusing services on um, student instruction. Um, do you think that that implies a trend of bifurcation in universities where we will see a different kind of workforce evolving at universities that are largely research focused versus universities that are focused more on um, large uh, groups of undergraduate teaching. Um, I mean, that's the implication of that finding, and I just wondered if any of the focus groups um, walked through um, that line of thought. I know the question was opposed to me, but um, I, I, I wanted to say something that about that finding and see if, 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 if Sarah or you agree, because I think that finding is a little bit an artifact of the way the scenarios were intentionally written. Because having participated in the development of the scenarios, I know that um, we felt that the teaching and learning issues were well, of course, since MOOCs in this morning's discussion, they're probably not better understood, but that they were handled in other places that um, ACRL does a lot of work in this arena. There's a lot of other conversation, and that only in ARL do we focus um, on the future of research and research support in this way. And so the scenarios were explicitly written to focus on that. And, and yes, they're, you know, I think they create um, some important thinking about where research universities are going. But in, in reality, of course, there's an income base from the undergraduate education. Um, and the discussion about MOOCs this morning shows that people are pretty, that while teaching and learning is changing, it's still pretty intense. So I, I wouldn't want a finding um, to be something that was really um, yeah, unintentional. It was an artifact kind of of the way the scenarios were intentionally written. Okay, uh, yep. panelists, uh, let's address these two and we'll move on to the next. Sure, the, the, the setup was actually beautiful because you, you covered both of the pieces that I wanted to suggest. The ARL scenarios are themselves an artifact. They are, um, they are fictions. They are fictions that are created with purpose. And, and, and they're beautiful, um, self-contained stories of possible realities. The, the, the piece about scenarios is none of them are true, will be true. Aspects of all of them could become true. And they're, they're really just points of discussion. And what we did in our, in our focus groups was just present those scenarios and have people imagine. And they imagined that if the, any of those scenarios were true, 
this is the point at which we would reach. And then they would reflect backwards and say, does that seem real to me? Does that resonate? And I must say that this, is, this teaching and learning piece is, is, has been one of the big discussion points when people um, discuss our, our findings. And some people have said, it's true. I see it happening today on my campus. I see my campus stepping away from teaching and learning and focusing on, 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 on coddling the research stars because that's where the future is and that's where the money is. And, and, and so they, it seemed very true. And other people have said, no, it's not true. On my campus, I don't see this happening for 20, 30 years. It's really just an opportunity for you to reflect. And Carol's nodding affirm affirmatively, so I think I've, I've answered it correctly, so I'm going to stop talking right now. Okay. <laughs> so anything, uh, John, you want to add? OK. Well, let's move on, because I think the next part of this will uh, actually complement some of this future thinking with the realities of what we've seen in the last year. So um, I'm really pleased uh, to uh, introduce you to Tio, Tiero, Tito Sierra, Associate Director for Technology at MIT. Uh, and he will be presenting on Staffing for the Future, ARL University Library Hiring in 2011. He recently completed the Library Career and Development Program and his research investigated how research libraries are staffing for the future by examining their planned investment in new professional positions. So, Tito. Okay, I have uh, 20 minutes to cover a, a year and a half long study, so I'm gonna jump into it. Um, basically, the uh, study that I'm gonna present the findings on uh, in this presentation uh, tackled two big research questions. One is the question, which is the theme of, part of the theme of this uh, forum, which, which is how are research libraries staffing for the future? It's a kind of a big question. Um, and the other um, research question that I was trying to tackle with my study was, what are the new emerging uh, uh, jobs in the research library profession? What are the new uh, positions that are being created within our organizations? So the data source for my study was vacancy announcements, specifically from ARL University libraries. So I basically took the 113 uh, ARL University libraries and looked at a time period which was the 2001 calendar year to get a full year of hiring. So basically the study is a year in the life of ARL uh, University Library hiring. The specific methodology, again, focus on 2001. So I cannot report on any sort of trends that uh, come out of here. This is really a snapshot of a single year. Um, and the focus in terms of the positions that I was looking at were full-time professional positions. So that necessarily excludes contract positions, term positions, support staff, civil servants, students, etc. I also excluded medical and law libraries as part of this analysis. So the method that I used to collect the data was to actually manually harvest uh, from university websites and library websites the job descriptions that you all post uh, for positions in your organizations. And I, I basically did this um, uh, quarterly. So at the end of March, I went through all 113, pulled down the jobs from your site, and I did that again in, in June, uh, September, and then uh, December. And this is the uh, summary of the data that was collected. So this is a sampling method, so it doesn't have the ground truth in terms of all the positions that you all posted, but it has a pretty good sampling. Um, and you can see through Q1 through Q4, uh, there was a, a fair amount of job postings uh, that were advertised during this period, and uh, evidence of there not really being a seasonal kind of pattern to how ARL hires happen. In terms of the percentage of libraries that had data, uh, had jobs in my data sample, it fluctuated between 55 and 65 percent. If you look at the year as a whole, uh, I found, um, and, and, and deduping the, the, the positions that uh, straddled multiple uh, quarters, because some of you have trouble filling your positions, um, I found 444 unique job descriptions. So a lot of what I'm going to report on are those, is that particular sample. And so 82.3, a little bit over 80 percent of the ARLs that I studied had at least one job in the sample. I should note anecdotally or 
the data suggests that the 20, there were 20 that had no jobs in my sample, uh, were, all, uh, um, were all public universities. So the, I also collected some supplemental data, and some of you may have received an email in the last month asking you to help fill out some additional information about the jobs that I found on your site. Is there anybody in here that actually filled out my questionnaire? <laughs> OK, thank you. I'm very happy to report that I got uh, data for 96.6% of the jobs. So of the 444, I got uh, follow-up data on 429 of those. And so the rest of the presentation will summarize the findings from those 429. So thank you very much for participating in this. Um, the specific follow-on questionnaire for those who didn't uh, actually do it was a single question uh, to ask the library administrators to assign a category to each job that I found on their website. And specifically, uh, there was a uh, basically a set of categories that describe the level of newness of that position to the organization. So at one end of the spectrum, you can have jobs that are a refill of an existing role in the organization. And on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's a completely new position. So now I'll summarize the analysis. Um, so I'm going to present the analysis according to two dimensions. One is the type of job responsibility. So here I'm talking about, uh, one could call it a level. Uh, for example, senior leadership versus a department head level position, and then a differentiation between functional specialists and subject specialists. Subject specialists being positions that provide library services for a specific designated subject area. And these category assignments were assigned by myself. The other dimension is the thing that I just mentioned in terms of the follow-up questionnaire was determining the level of newness, the job role newness to the organization. And there I had uh, three main categories, which is the role was an existing role. So the position was refilling a role that previously existed. Uh, or the position description is similar to a previously existing role, but had been significantly redefined. So the specific terminology in the questionnaire I used was the position is similar to a previously vac vacated position, but the position description has been significantly re redefined. And finally, the new role. So this is a position that's new to the organization. And I also had another category in case my particular categories didn't, uh, weren't perfect. So here's the, the meat of the data here. So as you can see on the bottom right, the total number of jobs that were classified was 429. And then you see the distribution across the two dimensions. So on the columns, you see the level of newness, so existing roles being the first column, and then uh, new being the third column. And then you can so also see it based on the, uh, the, the type of job responsibility. So my laser pointer works. So I'll point out a couple of interesting things. Uh, first is you can see the, the distribution here in terms of existing, redefined, and new. It's actually, if you add up the redefined and new, it's actually over 50% of existing. So in terms of the ARL hiring, we're not just mostly refilling existing positions. There are opportunities that are being taken to redefine positions and also create new ones. In fact, I, I, I thought the number of newly created positions was actually quite high. Um, the other thing you'll see is when you look at it framed against the particular level of job responsibility, you also see some interesting patterns um, in terms of uh, the new subject specialists, uh, nine positions of the 429 were subject specialist positions that were new to the organization. When you look at functional specialists, it's 87. So the distribution of the um, new newly created positions is disproportionately uh, centered towards functional specialist positions as opposed to subject specialist positions. So this is the same data. This is the 429 jobs except represented visually. And this is using 100% scale. So you can see the relative differences across the different categories. So again, if you look here, you'll see that um, the blue are, those are existing roles. So those are mostly uh, refills of vacated positions. Uh, the red are redefined roles. And then the green are the newly created roles. So these are roles that don't exist in the organization. And the functional specialists have the greatest share, in terms of the share, 
uh, functional specialists have a greater share of new positions than any other category, whereas they're much rarer among the subject specialists, for example. Uh, the other thing that I did to try to make some sense of the data set was to actually try to visualize the job titles to give you a sense of what these positions are. Um, and I, I should mention that um, outside of the room is a handout, is a two-page handout, which I, I encourage you to pick up, which summarizes the data, includes these word clouds and the, and the data tables, um, if you're interested in looking at more of the details. So this is existing roles. I took the job titles put them in a word cloud, extract, um, removed commonly occurring words, and you can see the sort of keywords one would expect to see in a research library. Uh, research, collection, sciences, business coming up as uh, the, the, the dominant uh, keywords. Now if we uh, compare that to redefined roles, so I took the set of redefined roles, did the same thing, you see the prominence of the word digital start to show up. You also see um, cataloging actually emerges as, as a, a keyword that um, becomes more common in these redefined roles as well. Uh, technology, uh, the word curator uh, also appearing in the redefined roles. And finally, this is the, the tag cloud for the new roles. So um, you can see the word digital is extremely prominent and the, the size is the indication of the frequency of the word. Um, but you also see other keywords emerge here, like data and uh, technology management. Um, so I encourage you to look at the handout so you can compare and contrast these in more detail. So to summarize the findings from this uh, research study, um, over 80% of the ARLs had at least one job in the data sample. So. Uh, one of the things that was a concern at the very start of this project when I was uh, thinking about uh, doing it, I got some feedback that suggested this might not be a good research study because I might not find any jobs. So this was, this was in 2010. Um, you, this is at the, the economic crisis, and so I was going to do this research study for 2011, and things were looking kind of gl uh, gloomy at that point. But um, there is still hiring, or there was hiring that happened in 2011. Um, I think it's quite interesting to see that over half of the jobs that were in this data sample were either newly created positions or significantly redefined roles. I think that's actually showing, it's promising, it's suggesting that we're making an effort to really rethink the positions in our profession. Um, two thirds of the functional specialist positions were created or redefined roles. The handout that I have outside actually shows nearly all of the new functional specialist job titles. So you can actually go through that list and look at what these jobs are. And you'll know it's in alphabetical order because I'm a librarian. And you'll see that when you get to Ds, you'll see digital, 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 digital. It just repeats. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at those. Less than a third were refills of existing positions. Um, there seems to be some differences in terms of how subject specialists and functional specialists are distributed in terms of level of newness. Um, although of the, of the entire set, and I'll, and I'll go back to, the, uh, to this visualization, you'll actually see that among subject specialists, they have the greatest share of the, within their particular category of redefined roles. So there's not a lot of new positions being created in that area, but there are a lot of redefined positions. And about half of the newly created position, functional specialist positions, which is the largest category of new positions, have a strong digital or technology focus. Um, and you can look through those job titles and it becomes pretty apparent. And that's intuitive. One would expect that that's, that's actually happening. Um, however, uh, research libraries continue to create plenty of uh, new positions in what might call traditional library areas such as special collections administration and public services. So even in the category of newly created positions, there are a lot of um, special collections jobs, administration jobs, and other jobs that are being created. It's not just digital, it's not just data curation, it's not just data management, e-science, so on and so forth. Um, so that's the end of my talk, and I want to point out the fact that 
the um, data set, which is the uh, four, actually 605 job descriptions that I found as part of this study, is available for downloading at that link. So if you want to run some, uh, do some research on those job descriptions, you're welcome to do that. The data's there, go have at it. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. So um, a couple of things before I open it up for questions and observations, comments. Um, is that um, I think uh, Tito's, we've, we have two different kinds of perspectives here. And as we look at new positions being defined, I think uh, it's, it's interesting to look at that emphasis on digital, the emphasis on data curation, that sort of thing. And Tito was kind enough to uh, provide me with a, a copy of his survey. So I put it in and I looked at what were the job qualifications that I was seeing. I used um, digital data and uh, e-science as just the terms under only the qualifications, not the titles of the positions. And of the positions with those, I think it was 68 in number, 55% of them mentioned the MLS or the MLIS as uh, something that might be desirable or required. Only three of them uh, had positions posted listing digital curation skill sets uh, as critical in the uh, qualifications. And um, as we look at our e-science uh, work moving into e-research, the differences between the requirements associated with e-science, which were much more focused on technical knowledge and the archiving of uh, digital data and repositories and ontologies versus what the digital human, humanities folks were, were being requested to have, which was research methods and processes and, and trends in scholarly communication and digitization. You know, it, it, we need to continue to respect the differences in those disciplines, but also start to understand where is some of that common knowledge that we're going to need to build across all of it. I think it also raises questions around what are the, um, the appropriate levels of skills that we need to bring in and, and a lack of definition around what exactly we're looking for. Um, I will also ask Tito about uh, how many positions uh, was the median per institution last year uh, that had been posted, and I believe you said there was 1.9. Uh, it's actually, so the, uh, the most common number of job postings within the 90 that actually had at least one job was, was one job followed by two. Um, there were um, a small number, I think it was about 10, that had more than 10. So it tends to follow, um, I think the highest, the era that had the most job posts, I'm not going to mention who it is, but I think it was about maybe six, 16, 15 or 16, mm -hmm. but most were one, one or two jobs. Mm -hmm. And there were 20 that had none in the sample, and it's possible that I, I missed it or when I went to the quarterly sampling I didn't capture it, but it so happens that all of those were public universities. Right. And, and uh, when we were talking earlier, you pointed out that uh, doing the correlation against the investment index would also provide additional information right. around that. Because if we're, if we're counting on a, a future in which we need all these new skills, it's going to take us a while in terms of employing new folks. So I think a lot of our work really needs to focus on the necessary change that has to occur through redeploying our current, current staff. Um, and I think there are some, some issues there. Um, overcoming staff resistance to the change I would put as way high on the list. Uh, I don't know if uh, many of you took a look at the um, significant skill gaps in supporting evolving researchers' information needs that came out of the Research Libraries UK. They identified a range of skill sets that the subject specialist self-identified as lacking. Um, and there were such things as the ability to advise on preserving research outputs, data management, 
uh, complying with mandates of funders, you know, all the usual good things that we would, would expect to see them um, wanting to have. But what was more interesting about it was they were asked, is this essential now versus two to five years from now? The highest one which got essential now was knowledge on data management and curation. 10% said it was essential now to have, and 48% said it was essential in two to five years. I think there's a little bit of, man, I don't want this to be on my watch, but it will be on our, on our watch. <laughs> We've got to deal with, with it. Um, and, and a really key issue is what are we going to give up? I don't know about staff at your institution, but you know I think it is um, pretty true that um, it's easy to think of new things we need to do and much harder to think of the things we can shed, which we have prided ourselves on for the longest time. And so that staff actually end up being overstressed um, because they would rather do more new things than give up doing some, some of the old things. It's, it's, a, it's a really difficult thing to do. Um, so we're obviously not only going to have to retool, but we're also going to have to provide the incentives and the, uh, the, the carrots and the sticks in terms of those kinds of change. And I think the issues around those rewards and those flexibilities in time and place that uh, the first uh, group talked about, the sort of virtual um, folks, I think is going to be in important. We also need to look at how we change our organizational structures uh, to reflect that. We're either going to be baned or we're going to figure it out ourselves. If any of you who've joined Cornell and having Bain come and tell you about your spans and layers, um, you know, don't go there. Um, I had uh, someone uh, remark the other day that um, where we see org charts, um, uh, they see red tape. And, and so, you know, we spend a lot of time in, in sort of developing these elegant kinds of, of um, charts. And then finally, I think new measures, new expectations for successful performance. And at yesterday's uh, TRL library meeting, there was a really robust discussion about what is the new librarian, what is the new information professional, do we redefine what a librarian is and throw everybody into that bucket, or do we start to define uh, additional buckets for uh, um, professionals who work in these challenging new ways. So with that, I would like to open the floor for questions, observations. Nancy Elkington, OCLC Research. Tito, I'm curious in your follow-up questions back to the ARL directors or their delegates, um, did you get a sense of fill rates for these positions? I didn't. Did it you ask? It w no, I wanted to get the response rate as high as possible, okay. and so I wanted to <laughs> um, ask a single question for each job, um, and my focus in this particular study was I try to identify what are the new positions being created in the profession. So um, I didn't use that opportunity to ask about refill rates. Although I did get uh, somebody comment on the fact that uh, some of the positions they had posted weren't filled because they had gone through a reorganization and had re then reshifted those positions into new positions. So this is kind of a fluid environment that, that we're in. Um, I did see several of the positions span multiple uh, quarters. That was not uncommon. Hello, Susan Fliss from Harvard College. I have a question for all of you, sort of um, building on, on your questions from before, Carol and, and Sarah. So, Tito, in the uh, descriptions of the, the word descriptions of the jobs, in the existing jobs, um, I was looking for teaching and learning, and I saw the word instruction. And then in the, um, the wording for the new jobs, I saw learning. And that's a shift from what, how we thought of those jobs, you know, say 15 years ago to now. Um, and I'm wondering if while we talk about whether teaching and learning will be important, if it's become so part of what many of the librarian positions do now, public services, research services, even curators, special collections librarians, that it's it's not having that prominence in the titles or in actually how the jobs are being 
um, written up. I mean, we may have we used to have coordinators of education. Has that gone away because we have so many people that we now expect to do that teaching and outreach? And that would be a question for all of you to answer. Thank you. I would observe that I, I think some of the language that's used to describe certain functions has evolved over time. So in positions, for example, the prominence of the word metadata in what are, based on the review of the description or cataloging positions, is interesting. So sometimes we're calling things using different words for very similar roles. Um, in terms of, I wouldn't, from the tag clouds, infer any sort of um, uh, less importance to certain kinds of functions like reference or instruction. This was a snapshot of a single year, so I can't provide any sort of trend analysis, although that would be interesting to do. But um, you can certainly go through uh, the job database and look at jobs and do keyword searches for uh, instruction and reference to sort of see how those positions are described. It's not a huge uh, sample, so it's actually fairly manageable to go through. The tag clouds, I, I wouldn't read too much into it. The point of it was to give you a gist of what's emerging within those clusters of categories of existing positions versus new positions. I could just add that I think many of us could attest to the fact that when you're thinking about a new position, you sometimes spend an inordinate amount of time talking about what you'll call that person. Um, and people are nodding. Um, sometimes you, it's, it's um, more than you spend talking about what that individual will do. And, and the name becomes a, a trigger or a flag to the world. And that sometimes we hesitate to give a new position an old sounding name. And, and, and so some of us may be shying away from using a very traditional job title like instruction, even though it remains a core role within a, an individual's uh, set of duties um, for, that, for that reason. Um, it, it changes things up a bit. Be interesting to study or to look at why one would use instruction versus teaching or learning. That would be an interesting thing. Um, going forward if you continue. Thank you. Uh, Linda Plunkett from Boston University. Hi. Um, I, we often teach our graduate students the power of qualitative and quantitative research, and I think this panel is exemplary in that. It's just so powerful. It's a huge takeaway for us. Thank you. We were going to start our presentation by saying that there would be no numbers involved. <laughs> My mantra was look, look for the uh, what's the uh, look for the look at the money. Look at the, where the money is being spent. Follow the money. Follow the money. <laughs> Follow the money. That was my mantra to try to understand where the um, investment in the future was going, was to look at where organizations were actually committing uh, positions for full-time permanent positions because that is a really large long-term organizational commitment to hire a permanent professional staff person. So it was follow the money was my mantra. Carol. Uh, well, um, this isn't exactly a question, I, and it's probably too hard to go back to the slide, but um, the first team uh, kind of ended with Shimo having a slide about questions for us and wanting to, about ways forward. And, and, and of course, um, I've managed not to keep those in my head. And, and I wonder, not see, if people have other stuff they want to talk about, that's fine, but when I saw not lines at the microphone. I, I wondered if you guys wanted to stimulate some of those questions that you had uh, ended with. That would be great if people were willing to, to have that conversation with us. Our, our group is very interested in, in delivering something to the research library community that is helpful. And we want to find a way of packaging our very humble research results into something that can be of assistance in a local library. But we're not sure where to take it from here. I, I can say that I've done a similar um, type of, of uh, experience with my own staff back at McMaster. And the staff involved my secretary and people, uh, uh, librarians and um, 
professional managers, a small group, but we went through the scenarios and they arrived at, at actually some of the same results that the ARL directors did. And they were very happy to hear that afterwards. But, but it's a question of how, how, do you, how do you package that kind of information and make it helpful. So if, if anyone in the audience has a suggestion to us for how we can share our results, um, we would be most happy to receive them either now or later. Gary? Uh, Gary Strong from the UCLA Library, and I won't answer that last question you just posed. I have an observation to make, and that is that a statement was made uh, during one of our meetings somewhere during this conference that if you look at the longevity of um, uh, ARL directors, that there's this large new uh, cohort that have come on uh, the deck in the last five years. And I would suggest that one thing that might be useful is to separate those folks out into a room by themselves, away from the rest of us, and ask them where they would like to take research libraries with their leadership over the next five years. And I would suspect that some of what you would find, and dump all this on their heads, uh, and I would suspect that you would find some incredibly interesting information out of that exercise. Yeah, great. <laughs> so I was interested in your point about, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm Lorraine Harry from University of Kansas, and I was interested in TITUS analysis. Perhaps you haven't done this, but you mentioned um, long-time permanent investments um, of these new positions. Was it clear to you in those um, advertisements whether they were faculty positions, librarians as faculty positions, or did you notice any sway away from that? Uh, perhaps, I'm not sure if you analyzed that, but I'd be interesting to yeah. I, you know. I didn't analyze that, but um, there's actually a lot of additional analysis that could be done on that data set um, by looking at things like um, whether or not an MLS is required, whether or not it's tenure track, mm -hmm. uh, many, any, any number of analyses that could be done on that data set. My focus was really looking at what are the new professions that are being, uh, the new positions that are being created but I welcome uh, other folks to go through that data set and extract that. I have the full descriptions uh, so they can be mined for that sort of information. So I was thinking about uh, the, um, uh, the recommendations that you all came out with or findings that there will be more deep subject expertise in uh, the future and fewer generalists Yet, Tito, when you were looking at the new positions, they weren't so much in the subject expertise area, but rather in the functional. Um, either of you care to comment? Any of you care to comment on that? I think we might have been speaking in shorthand, to be honest. I, I think the key finding uh, was away from the generalist and towards deeper knowledge, not necessarily the subject. Mm -hmm. it, it could be um, a functional expertise. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, in my, in my analysis and differentiating functional specialists and subject specialists was really, subject specialists would be a position that specifically required us an advanced degree in a particular subject or had a specific subject named in the title. But the, if you look at the list of functional specialist uh, positions that are newly created positions, they're highly specialized positions. So in a sense, it's, I don't think there's a conflict there. There's a, just a debate on whether or not um, there's hiring for a specific subject discipline. Okay. I can certainly, Rick. Rick. Rick Luce, University of Oklahoma. Um, none of you touched directly or e even really indirectly on the question of organizational culture. So if you take any of these individuals, newly defined and described and, and whatever, and in ones and twos and threes and literally plunk them down into existing organizational culture, it's unlikely, in my view, it's unlikely they'll thrive. So I uh, just wonder if the panel might comment uh, how, you, how you've thought about that. Culture trumps strategy every day of the week is I think that's what they that's what they say. It's a good point. I mean, in our conversations uh, with the RLLF fellows, 
and, okay. and with the directors uh, and with the UCLA senior fellows, the, the, the concept of culture did not actually emerge, possibly because the concept of culture didn't show itself in the ARL scenario set. And so it didn't jump off the page to them. Uh, and we probably didn't have enough time to dig really deeply into the implications of actually rendering all of these brilliant ideas um, because it's not till you get to the rendering of the ideas that you hit culture. Uh, and that's the obstacle for success. Rick, my, my comments is I would hope there will be the tipping point if we very aggressively, rigorously practice recruiting new and repurpose existing, then the culture will start shifting. The more new position, new title, new responsibility, new credential, new kinds of the person and professionals being brought into our organization, I would hope someday that a tipping point will be reached and the culture will start to shift. I think this is fundamentally important to cultivate, to cultivate a new culture for the organization for the future. The only thing I, I would add as an afterthought, the piece where culture did come up was around collaboration within the workforce and the desperate need for directors as we add new kinds of people into our workforce that we create an, um, an, an environment within which these new professionals can succeed. So the culture of collaboration and mutual respect and, and civility in the workplace was, I think, the, the, the piece that touched maybe the closest on, on culture in the conversations that we had. Yes. Raina Bowlby, I'm a library consultant. Um, I wanted to say that I thought you absolutely touched on culture, uh, Vivian, when you made the point that um, in, from the group, the quote was, we need staff to transform themselves rather than waiting for us to transform them. And I think that's an, a significant culture change in our organizations. If we can achieve that, we can do as much with the retooling side, that 50% of the side that we're doing through retooling as through uh, new hiring. So there's a culture issue too. Thanks, Raina. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ed Van Gemmert from Wisconsin. Thank you for, for your work and your comments. I have two observations, if I could. One is around um, the pace of turnover of positions. My sense is that, and I don't know if this is a regional thing or unique or whatnot, but my sense is that in, in the areas of technology particularly, we're seeing much more rapid uh, turnover of technology. It, in plain English, not being able to keep up with the rates of pay from, uh, from private industry. Um, and in the areas, the more traditional uh, areas of librarianship, very little, if any, turnover. So, you know, kind of a problem, you know, in terms of the, the repurposing point that you were making. So that's thought number one. And, and, and the second observation is that, in, and I saw a little bit of pushback, I guess, on one point. Um, in, in, in the larger research R1 institutions, in some cases, being a generalist can be viewed as being a specialist. If, if that makes any sense to you, it's, it's oftentimes the entry into uh, our institutions, and, and there, are, there are positions, and in fact libraries, where being a generalist is viewed, especially at the church teaching and learning level, as being a specialty. So, thank you. My, my reaction to the turnover is, I think that to, to keep the organization are very aiming on the future, maintain certain percentage of the turnover is not the bad thing. Um, it gave you the opportunity to, to address that recruiting and uh, repurposing, uh, retooling issues. I would just add one thing, which is um, in, 
in my particular research study, because I focused on uh, continuing appointment positions um, that necessarily excluded a whole raft of uh, technology positions that were two-year or three-year contract positions that were fairly common. Um, so the numbers that I presented in terms of new positions, functional specialist positions um, that are technology or digital oriented is probably lower than the reality if you were to include uh, term positions. Right. Did you want to say? I just wanted to go back to Rick's point about culture. I think that's a really good question. And one of the things that's really powerful about these scenarios is they allow for these new ideas to come into a conversation with your staff. And that's really where I think if we have more structure around these kind of conversations, it's going to allow for that culture to change. Right? That's, that's what I would say. It's a good question. And we have time for you, too. <laughs> Great, thank you. Kathleen DeLong, University of Alberta Libraries. Um, just to comment on that other professionals uh, classification that we've talked a lot about this afternoon. Whenever there's a discussion of that, I'm, I'm always a little bit bemused, just because um, in, in my case, um, I also have a master's in public management, which I uh, took after my MLIS degree. And so sometimes when there's this discussion of other professionals, you know, I want to show, you know, I'm feral too, I'm feral too. Because, you know, really, if we're talking about other professionals and um, valuing them for the uh, perspectives and uh, that they bring to an organization, I think that there is, you know, a lot to be said for the, ML, the um, MLIS holders who, you know, went out and 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 took that um, initiative to become an other as well. And yet, that it doesn't ever seem to be part of the discussion. I, I think it's a very important part of the discussion. Um, but it's interesting because once you have an MLIS, it's you know, it's like you cross the Rubicon, and and that's that's your defining identity. Right. <laughs> Pam. Pam Bjornsson, National Research Council of Canada. I just wanted to say a quick word about culture because one of the things that I've noticed is it doesn't have to be one big monolithic thing that we do. I think that we can do small things. I notice myself a major culture change in my own organization that occurred when we had um, a wiki that staff use. It's called Agora. And... Um, They've started to use it for everything. They've started to use it as a sort of internal Facebook. They're using it as a way to set up services. They're teaching each other and they're learning from each other on it. They're even interacting with their clients on it in some cases. And actually, it's not something that we did. In fact, we almost had to get out of the way. I don't take any responsibility other than authorizing to pay for it um, for this sort of change. And I had no idea at the time that it was going to be such a deep cultural change in the organization. Because they don't have to go to somebody uh, and get something put on the web and translated, and they don't have to go through all the formal procedures. It's just up, it's out in three minutes, and away it goes. So I think there's lots of more things that we can probably do, including getting out of the way occasionally, to support staff to, to have that sense of empowerment and professionalism that uh, is not dependent uh, on anyone else, and that allows them to actually speak directly to each other. Well, I want to thank John and Vivian and Shamo and Tito for what I think is really just some food for thought. Uh, I think we'll have uh, more interesting uh, analysis around what our future staffing patterns look like, how we recruit, retain, uh, reward, um, uh, those who are coming into our professions and those who are here and um, get a new renaissance around what it is to be a library professional. So we've come to the close of this session. Um, at uh, 15 minutes in the stateroom, uh, there will be a reception. So you have 15 minutes to check email. But before you do so, please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.